call a meeting in order the board of education. Call to order the meeting of the board of education, Mrs. Hutchinson. Please call the board. Mr. Here. Mr. Here. Mr. Here. Mr. Hamlin. Here. Mr. Robin. Here. I'll keep an eye. Here. Mr. Bennett, could you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Did you get it? 
better than me, so that the next time we do it, we can do it better together. Um, these are our materials and our ideas, but we can let them. So after running the test together, uh, and after our students have taken the test, we use the test um, to analyze the, the data and think about uh, things like, was the test fair? So we look at things like, this was the hardest question for students, this was the easiest question for students. We also consider how we taught uh, those subjects. So for example, in eighth grade, uh, Brian and I are currently doing unit on career depression, and we're both teaching the stock market a little bit differently. So a couple of years when we have our assessment, we'll look at the common question on the stock market, and then we can kind of compare it and see which way of teaching the stock that students understand understood better, um, and use that data to bring you know, up plans for next year. We also use assessment data to think about alternate tests. So if we have students that might need to be more challenged, um, instead of having them take the multiple choice test, we might have give them an essay test. If you have a student who might need a little bit more help, um, we have alternate tests for them too. Um, and looking at the tests after we admit, we're able to make changes to the tests so we can then use them the following year. So we're not only thinking about how we can use tests for this school year, but also for the future. And when we look at our test data, uh, things that we look for would be the average score. So what was the average score of all students? So one way that we look at the data is the, the scan data machine gives us this data analysis sheet, right? And put up there, run under your you know, our scan class, and it shows you how many it's missed a certain question. Um, this is our Dean Collins test, and you can't see it, but I think it was number 46. I think I had like 47 kids missed this question. I went over to Ryan and I said, how many people is that machine for you? He had less. We had a really frank conversation about how I taught that material compared to the way he taught the material so that we can better, um, I can better my lessons for next year. So the data analysis she helps us a lot with multiple choice tests. Of course, we can't do that when we do things like essays, but we're able to break it down um, by hand in that. This doesn't work. In eighth grade, we started this last year, so this is the second year that we're trying this, where we have students do their assessment using a Google form. So the test is done on a computer, and this has been beneficial as, as low-level assessments and some um, standardized tests are moving to computer-based assessments. Um, it gives students some practice. And with the Google form, after students have taken the test, we get a chart like this one uh, to show the averages. So using this data is pretty really beneficial. We can see um, where students fell, where their outliers compared to how other students did on the test. Um, it also breaks, Google Forms breaks down each question. So this question um, is about the vocabulary or the monopoly. Um, so we can tell from this question that our students really understood this vocabulary. Um, if the data on um, this question has looked differently, then you might sit down and think, OK, they didn't understand this vocabulary work, so how can we change the way that we taught it uh, to help them understand that? And then the last step, we take all our data that allows us to modify our test as it needed to help all English language, English learner students and 504 IEP students to meet their needs. And then we also are able to look at some quiz data to see throughout on the Google form if kids are mastering the entire unit, we might have some freedom to swap kids in each one of our classrooms where well, this is Kay or Will myself, um, <coughs> Or units on World War One, we had kids swap classrooms for the same unit, and I went to debate my class for kids that were facing all the formative assessments and wanted to do more of a high school level exam, as we called it, uh, for eighth graders. She ran all the Socratic seminar, but it was not as much competition based. And then we had the same basically questions along the way for the students, but then how they presented what they learned was a totally different format. We swapped kids for a few days, they would check in with us, and then we would flip flop back it's over and then go through the next unit kind of the same format and everybody to support we don't always need a teacher and you can kind of swap pages with the classroom. 
change the highest support the lowest, and then yet we still have our common assessment. Where we usually about 45 or 50 questions identical, so we compare those to the questions we need. So we can create a town in the classroom and have questions based on the lessons that we have. So our PLC never ends. We are constantly PLC. This is for school, after school passing periods. We're constantly bouncing the ideas back and forth. Scratch lessons that didn't work in the morning, we get by the afternoon. And that what we're going to do is take all the data we have from our formative common assessments and that will drive what we're going to assess the uh, kids on to make sure we're changing everybody is reporting in the room as we do.
the view with the board coming up in PLC survey after the first of the year, and, and some board members may be inclined to say, gosh, haven't we done this already for a while? Um, it, it is for us, I think, uh, an, an ongoing commitment that we make to continue to improve our, our craft. I don't think PLC work is going to go away anytime soon, nor should it go at all off of uh, our radar. So thank you to the Franklin staff for, um, I think, highlighting that important work. So that said, uh, Erica, floor is yours. exciting invitation to our groundbreaking event on January 15th at 2.45 p.m. We will uh, break ground on a new Jefferson Early Childhood Center. Uh, we will start with a short program in the gym. Um, we anticipate that it will still be cold outside, so we'll have uh, the uh, longer portion of our event in the gym. Um, we'll have some comments. There's a group of Jefferson students that are very, very eager to lead us in the pledge. Uh, they, they've asked about it multiple times, and so they're excited to do that. Uh, we, will, we are planning to incorporate students into the program. Uh, they will join us for that as well. Um, we have some surprises in store, too, some um, opportunities for community member involvement. Uh, we've, we're um, getting some little river rocks that all of the students uh, at Jefferson will decorate um, and community members and board members will still have an opportunity to um, decorate a commemorative rock and then uh, those rocks will be incorporated they will be placed under the foundation of the school and so we thought that that was very ceremonious but also um, the students that are currently at Jefferson will not be able to um, enjoy the new building and so we thought that this was a great way for them to still participate in the new building and be a part of that as well. So um, that should be um, an exciting opportunity. We uh, will then go outside after our program and we will shovel a little dirt um, and community members after the ceremonial groundbreaking will have an opportunity to shovel some dirt too. This event is open to anyone in the community to attend and we are looking forward to it. So if you have any questions, if you need additional invitations, uh, please let us know and we will get those for you. Yeah, I think uh, Gambiani's question is it's not going to be frozen dirt as of uh, January. We're, we're going to bring a little bit of dirt in to help you with that uh, that digging process in, uh, in, in January. But um, board members, if, if you would not mind, I would uh, ask if you could just uh, let uh, let me know if you are able to uh, to attend that evening. So um, we're going to be uh, setting up kind of that uh, first dig of the dirt, and, and of course we want to make sure that all board members uh, are part of that. We've also invited uh, our uh, local mayors from all of our municipalities to be uh, a part of that. Uh, executive director from the park district, as well as a few other special uh, invited guests to, to be a part of that uh, that first shovel of, uh, of dirt that we go. So. Uh, please let us know if you can do that. A um, couple of other things, uh, uh, just uh, uh, really quickly, I wanted to uh, share with the board. Um, I had an exciting opportunity this week. Students at Longfellow Elementary School uh, uh, were uh, celebrating the birthday of the state of Illinois, and so third graders had some uh, really neat presentations that uh, uh, they did. They presented to the community. Uh, uh, Dr. Slug and I had a opportunity to pay a quick visit to, to Longfellow here to some of the student uh, um, work and, and uh, just a nice opportunity for the community to come in and, uh, and engage. So thank you to Longfellow staff for that. Um, board members in your packet, uh, uh, should be the first thing in your green folder, um, you have uh, a document uh, from uh, PMA um, that provides for you the summary of the, uh, the closing of the sale of the, the lease certificates and uh, just an uh, important thing that I wanted to share with the board uh, when um, we were projecting what we anticipated that those lease certificates were sell for, would sell for, we were projecting a 3.85% uh, interest rate. They went out to competitive sale this week. The interest rate that we got was actually 37 
Um, so your annual lease payment on the New Early Learning Center that uh, we had projected during the referendum, that million dollars will actually be $950,000 a year. So you are, are definitely seeing some uh, uh, savings in that, and we, we did hit the market, the municipal bond uh, market, at a, at a good time with the, the sale of those lease certificates. Uh, uh, also, just worth noting that uh, our uh, our LA uh, Plus uh, credit rating was affirmed before that sale, and so again, that certainly helped uh, to make sure that uh, um, we got uh, a, a really competitive rate on that. So, congratulations to uh, to everybody on that. Um, in your your green folder as well, uh, one of the other things that. Uh, uh, Diana has uh, provided for you that I can't put my hands on right at this second, but uh, is a summary of the donations that the board has received over the first, I got it, uh, over the um, first, uh, six, uh, the last six months uh, of the year. So uh, from August to uh, December, uh, we, we accept donations at every board meeting from uh, PTAs, Student Excellence Foundation, generous community members. Um, that support our schools uh, in, a, in a way that's uh, that's amazing. In total, for the last six months of the year, we've accepted $180,000 worth of donation to the um, school districts that, uh, that very, very much support both our program and uh, the mission that uh, 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 President Paulson highlighted a little bit earlier tonight. So I want to take a moment to recognize that. Um, uh, I did want to mention to the board, um, one of the items on the agenda for this evening is the acceptance of the audit. Uh, as we've uh, projected to the board in the, the past, there's been a delay across the state in the delivery of audits this year. The delay has nothing to do with the numbers that we've been able to provide or the, um, the audit work that the, um, the the auditors have done in-house. Um, it has to do um, with a state-level report that was issued at one time and then had to be recalled, reconfigured, um, and unfortunately is still on delay uh, right now. And so we have not actually received from the, uh, the auditors uh, that report. So when we come to that agenda item tonight, uh, the recommendation is going to be that we table that item until January. Uh, obviously, we, we can't deliver to you an audit report unless we actually have the, uh, the audit report. But uh, I do want to assure members of the board that um, the Finance Committee had an opportunity to really review what is the meat of the, the audit report, and that those are our own numbers. As soon as we can get that together, we're going to obviously get that out to the, um, to the board. But, but what it's going to tell the board, at least in terms of your own fiscal control responsibility this year. You had a good fiscal year that we just uh, closed out. So we're actually excited to get that report to you so that uh, you can affirm for the, the community that uh, uh, we did a very, very nice job of uh, managing the community's resource and finance uh, last year. But um, that's what's coming <clears throat> a little bit later. Um, and then the last thing I just wanted to mention um, for the, the board and the community is that I think all of our buildings this week have um, released to parents and to students the reminder about the five essentials um, survey. So five essentials is a uh, statewide uh, climate survey that uh, analyzes uh, uh, feedback from students this year. The student feedback starts in grade four. Um, in the past, that was only middle and high school students that participated. This year, fourth and fifth grade students um, participate as well and provide feedback on the instructional environments in um, each of their schools. Um, uh, it's also available to teachers um, at each of our school sites, and then it's available to parents uh, at each of our school sites. Um, there are required participation rates in order for us to get data through five essentials that is a component on our accountability matrix this year, not the outcome of five essentials, but the fact that certainly on the student and the teacher side that we hit the, the required participation rate. We've never had a problem in terms of participation rate from students and, uh, and from teachers, um, but if we don't get enough parent involvement and engagement in five essentials, we don't get that really important data as well. And so um, our buildings uh, have been have worked on a communication plan, have a series of communication reminders that are going out so that uh, hopefully we will get to uh, the, the required participation rate and get that valuable feedback 
as the board uh, knows from when we looked at that last year, we identified some items within our own dashboard that we want to be able to use the, the, uh, the five essentials data to help us uh, affirm and, and reinforce. So, survey is open. We hope everybody's going to participate uh, in that across the district. So, can we offer an opportunity, maybe at um, evening events at our schools where we have some computers out and we can have for staff there directing parents to take something that might be an opportunity to grab some people right then and there. And then I have a question. Um, for our middle school and high school students, is it still they're going to do just one subject area or one teacher, or are they doing the entire day? Because I remember a flaw with the, with the survey was, and especially even for parents, it, it, when it asks you about your child's teacher, and you happen to be a middle school or a high school parent, it was very difficult to answer that. They have had to say, I'm going to take a general answer, or I'm going to pick one subject area. And I was just curious what they were doing for the middle school and high school students. Faith, you want to answer the first question because I saw you jumping on the first one. Sure. Uh, Julio sent out an email about two hours ago suggesting to parents that it would be coming holiday events, concerts, all those kinds of things to make that available and have some devices there. You also can take it on your phone. So, yes, um, that, that piece is happening. Uh, to, to the second one, because uh, I don't know that we've ever zeroed people in on at middle and high school on only one class because the, the survey is not intended at the middle and high school level to be focused only on one teacher as much as the instructional environment. So I think that's probably still a bit of a challenge within the, the survey, but, but candidly one that I don't know that there's an, an easy resolve to. What I will say is that five essentials um, has, uh, has has been a resource supported survey that's been validated to, and shown to provide still useful and meaningful data in the way that it's currently constructed. But the, the instruction to, to teachers, and uh, Dave, you can re redirect me if I'm wrong on this, we don't encourage them to only focus on one class that they're answering the survey on. Is that right? Okay. Thank you. You can just yell. Kids, there's questions specific to uh, language like arts and math uh, about those content areas. So, uh, you know, like we do it all through uh, language like arts when they're doing their local assessments because they have focus on those that we can do it. And I'm pretty sure that's everyone has a similar plan. But I, it doesn't, that's the day we look at. I, I took the middle school and high school test today or the survey to, and it doesn't separate, it doesn't give you the opportunity to separate. It just says, does your student teacher? Right. That, that's my concern. It's asking you for very, I, I wrote a letter to the University of Chicago or you, I can't remember who did. I wrote it several years ago because it, it felt like when as a middle school parent, I was at, it would ask me about my child's teacher. I, I had to generalize. I couldn't be specific. And so I questioned that. That's the end of Yeah, I, well, I guess the only other thing I'll say about response is that it is intended to be a measure of school culture, not an evaluation of one individual teacher in classroom. And so I think the only way that you can probably get a global generalization of culture is to ask the question where people are broadly, even though it's saying teacher, kind of generalizing that to is my general sense that it's true or it's not true, as I think of teachers, but yeah, it's so challenging. Just to review the uh, bond sale, or not the bond sale, the lease certificates, just uh, to understand again, we have, uh, our estimated total cost for this project is, is what number? Uh, 15 and just a hair over 15 million dollars. Okay. And of that, we are, are funding that of this 13,395. Is that our proceed or are there fees that come out of that? Or is that the net number we receive? That, that, that's the net number. Okay. So we're getting basically 13,4 here. And we had funded a million and a half in the past. Okay. So we're up to 14,9. Uh, so that more or less covers the 15. <coughs> 
Yeah, so uh, the reason that uh, slightly less than $13.5 million were sold is that um, as, the, as the proceeds from that lease certificate sale are deposited, they are going to earn some interest as they're being drawn down and used. And so we're, we're calculating some of that interest earning into uh, that overall project. So uh, the, the, the balance of what you're missing there and probably a little over $100,000 is going to be an interest earning as that's sitting with the bank. I guess the other question, the $15 million is the nuts and bolts type of construction cost. Then on top of that, though, we have other costs. We, we have a, you have about a million and a half in, not a million and a half, a little over a million dollars in post-construction costs that will either be funded by district fund balance and or fundraising. Uh, or, or fundraising, okay. So that a million is the, the key number there that will, I, I'm thinking as we walk toward this uh, consumption of fund balance, I mean, that's where our exposure is, about a million dollars. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Dr. Shula? Just one comment on the, the groundbreaking for Jefferson, the idea of the students doing something with the rocks, painting the rocks and putting it in the foundation is awesome. I've never heard of that before. I'm going to borrow that. I think it's pretty fantastic. Okay, um, next item is the consent agenda. I thank Dr. Shula three times already for only five items on the consent agenda. So I'll read those five. Um, number one, acceptance of gift from Ecolab to Hawthorne Elementary School. Number two, approval of a resolution of a line item transfer within the transportation fund. Number three, approval of bills payable and payroll. Number four, approval of minutes, November 14, 2018, open and closed. November 28, 2018, special meeting. And approval to destroy recordings of closed sessions prior to July 2017 as allowable by law. And then number five, approval of personnel reports to include employment, resignation, retirement, and leave of absence from administrative, certified, classified, and non-union staff. Are there any items on the consent agenda the board members would like to be removed? Okay, Dr. Schuler, do you have any information to add? Uh, I, I do not. Okay, does the board have any questions or comments on any items? If not, I will ask for a do you have a question there? No. Uh, I'll ask for a motion to, uh, and a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda as presented. Uh, so moved. Second. Okay, moved by Mr. Broman, seconded by Ms. Erickson. Ms. Hutchinson, would you please call the roll? Mr. Broman? Yes. Ms. Erickson? Yes. Ms. Crabtree? Yes. Mr. Yes. Yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Yes. Consent agenda is passed. Um, now we move to action items. And the first item is the election of Board of Education officers. Right now we have a vacant seat for the Vice President. And so I would like to uh, ask for a nomination for the Vice President. I nominate enthusiastically and confidently this is Chris Crabtree to be the Vice President of the Board of Education. Okay, are there any other nominations for Vice President? Okay, so the, we don't need a second, we just need to ask for a roll call vote on the nomination of Chris Crabtree as Vice President. Uh, Mr. Roman? Yes. Secretary for the, <laughs> for the past couple of years, Chris has served as our secretary. Now we need to uh, seek a nomination for one of the members to serve as secretary of the Board of Education. I'd like to uh, nominate uh, Rob Hanlon as the uh, next secretary. Is that the thing you're talking about? You're willing to do it? Okay. Yeah, I will continue with my nomination. 
Okay, are there any other nominations for secretary? Okay, we don't have another one, so we just move right to a roll call vote for Rob Hanlon as secretary. Mr. Anderson? Yes. Mrs. Bradley? Yes. Mrs. Harrison? Yes. Mr. Gabriani? Yes. Mr. Hanlon? Yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Austin? Yes. All right. Congratulations. Congratulations. Uh, look forward to uh, next, at least the next couple of months. Um, the next item on our action item list is the acceptance of the 27 2018 financial audit. In light of Dr. Schuler's comments earlier that uh, we don't have an audit to accept, I'm going to ask for a motion in a second to table that until our January meeting. So moved. Second. By Mr. Gabiani, second by Mr. Hamlin. Do we need to take a vote on that? Yes, okay. Mrs. Hutchinson, will you take a vote? Mr. Gabiani? Yes. Mr. Hamlin? Yes. Mrs. Crabtree? Yes. Mrs. Harrison? Yes. Mr. Hamilton? Yes. Mr. Roman? Yes. Mr. Foster? Yes. Mr. Foster? Yes. Okay, so that will be on the agenda in January. And then the third and final action item for tonight is the approval of the 2019-20 and 2020-21 school calendars. Um, Dr. Shirley, you have any information to share on that? Yeah, I'm going to hand it over to uh, uh, Dr. Kyle. Is just going to give a couple of uh, reminders to the board again as he's making his way up to the podium. Uh, I want to thank uh, uh, both uh, Dr. Kyle, the members of the calendar committee, and everybody that I think took um, a thorough and very thoughtful approach to the development of the, the, the calendar. Um, this is an item that we recognize is never going to be met with universal support and enthusiasm. There just are a lot of opinions about the way that a calendar looks, but um, we, we did make sure that we took, I think, a very, very careful approach to the development of it. So, Dr. Kyle? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Schuler, and thanks, uh, some members of the school board. Um, I remember when you uh, mentioned that I was going to be part of this, you all laughed. I think through the process, I kind of understood that. But one thing I can say is, um, kind of looking back at the work that we've done, is we really did bring in a lot of feedback from all parties. And if people uh, wanted to give us their opinion, we took it. So I got 20 emails, feedback overall. What I thought I'd do is generalize them into categories so you can kind of get a feel for what the community um, had. So there were four emails about moving the November Institute days um, to match a polling uh, day for Pleasant Hill because Pleasant Hill is a polling place. I think many of you have seen emails about that uh, this past year. Uh, there were three emails to keep the calendars the same as they've always been, have finals before break, and then after break have uh, students work on lessons and units. There were five emails, I just got a new one yesterday, uh, that do not like the 2021 uh, calendar because it starts two days earlier. In all five emails, they expressed concerns over summer ending early, finals before winter break, and that could be stressful for kids, concern over the heat in August, and also concern that semester one would uh, be 10 days shorter than semester two. They also received two uh, emails that did not like that winter break in the 2021, 2020 and 2021 break is split midweek. Then we had three emails uh, that were concerned about elementary school students going a full week as opposed to three days. There were two supportive emails that really liked our work, which was uh, great to get. And then I got a letter uh, just yesterday about any change in a calendar is tough on divorced families. So I wanted to share that feedback I got from the community um, with the board so that you're aware of what we got. Um, and overall it was 20 emails and then one letter. Are there any questions or comments from board members? A couple of questions. Um, Dr. Kyle, can you remind us about how many parents took that survey? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that because um, I looked at that today before we, um, before I presented, I actually brought the survey. Uh, so we had 2,738 respondents, about, mm -hmm. about 100 more than two years ago when we did it in 2016. And if I remember correctly, about 80% of the parents surveyed said they wanted the finals before. Yes, 80% right? said they wanted the finals before. 
and out of the choices of how to get the finals before, really they only liked the one about moving two days before. So we went, that was what started our process, is getting the data from the staff, parents, and teachers. And then we also surveyed the students, and we surveyed the high school teachers as well. So our school year really is only starting two days prior. We're not starting two days prior a week. No, I think there's a misconception with a couple emails. They think we're starting a whole week early. And the feedback from the first survey was very clear. Nobody wants to start a week early. And I believe the committee would say nobody on the committee wanted to start a week early either. Which is why we then chose to have the next two, that to wait the two years to be able to do that. Yeah. Um, and then I know you said you mentioned the, the calendar committee. So is every grade level, uh, every level at least represented on the committee? Yes, every grade level, we even had a kindergarten representative. So we had every, not every grade level, but we had every level. So we had elementary, middle school, high school, and a kindergarten. We also had administrators, high school, middle school, and elementary. So we had a good, a good mix of support staff members as well. I think the two support staff members were at middle school. And we also, um, so we tried to make the committee as representing all the different levels. That was where the rich discussion came from because whenever you look at a calendar, there are, there are three or four different lenses to look at. And I think too for the community's sake to understand, I know that in the four years almost that I've been on the board, this has been a very active discussion that we've had. We've tried to move this way. I appreciate that we've taken our time and done due diligence and, and, and that to get there and that um, all of our staff and, and parents were represented and students and we surveyed students and that was a fairly large number that wanted the survey that we Yeah, they round up 76% of the 10th, 11th, and 12th graders uh, did want finals before break. And, and we, we asked that because of the data we got from the first survey. We thought, why not ask the students? And then one last thing to tie together for the rest of the board. Um, Mrs. Erickson and I will serve on the Teaching and Learning Committee and we have been talking final examinations for the past several years as well, and as finals are even beginning to change and what that looks like, I, I, I know that um, some, most of our English finals are cold reads, they're not studying for finals, they're an opportunity to apply knowledge and they learn right then and there, um, you know, so we're trying to be cognizant of that as well with finals being taken in, in December. Yeah, part of the reason why we asked for that 18 month delay before we change is because we do feel like we have some work to do at the high school and middle school level to balance out quarters and semesters and the exams, especially if you have uh, less days, you have to revisit those exams and those aren't done overnight. So we will be looking at our assessments as well. And I, I do believe with time, teachers will be able to make this a very successful change. Any other comments or questions? And, and Dr. Kyle, just for the record, we're not blazing trails here, are we, as a district? If you use our new conference, the Duquesne Conference, we would be the last school to have finals before winter break. That's every school in our conference, which would be Geneva, Batavia, St. Charles has switched, and then uh, Naperville 203, 204, they're in a different conference, but they were in our old conference. And then Lombard High School District as well has finals before in Lake Park. So all the schools in our New King Conference, we are not the first. We're probably one of the, the later ones. And, and most of these school districts have made that change by shifting out the start of school by a week, is that correct? A week, yes. We did find a district that we compare ourselves to, Barrington. They have a 10-day imbalance. So that is one of the models that we looked at the high school. And that somebody will also, they also have five days of elementary school. So that'll be somewhere I know the superintendent pretty well. We used to work together, so we're going to tap into how Barrington did that. The uh, the one thing I've heard, uh, I've made a number of inquiries about this. I think that even though we may be joining those districts in the finals beforehand, I think there's a, I found there was a number of uh, uh, districts that had different uh, Thanksgiving week programs. And that, you know, because we're giving up two to three days that way. And then, you know, that was the one item that I think we're different on. And it, and it does trouble me a little bit because of that 10-day imbalance. So, so I, I, you know. Every school district does it a little bit differently, but there were some pretty clear feedback from keep the Thanksgiving break the way it is, keep uh, winter break the way it is. So we tried to use those as we navigated through the calendar. 
I guess in summary, I'd like to, you know, as we move forward in this and we reevaluate our successes with it, you know, I, I think that's one that I would like to keep in mind as a possible change to, you know, be a little more flexible. I, I listened closely to the uh, elementary statement about that first week coming back from the younger kids is really, you know, a full week is very challenging. So, you know, that, you know, I, that we could change that in some respects if we get that in the days. And I, I recognize there's a lot of people that leave town anyway, you know, and so, you know, I, I think that's part of the complication, but uh, uh, it is something that concerns me basically. So. Does Jefferson and kindergarten start then on Tuesday, not on Monday? Second day. Yeah, I'd just like to comment. Uh, I appreciate what uh, Dr. Kyle has done here. Uh, he's a relatively new member of our staff to navigate this minefield and come to this conclusion and recommendation. I think it's a great achievement, so thank you for doing that. I'm still smiling. It was a, I got to know a lot of people, and it was a great experience. You guys really do a good job of getting a lot of input from all different parts of our um, of our community, so thank you. Okay, any other comments? Uh, just two quick things for me. I think, uh, one, I'd like to continue to keep a pulse on some of the feedback from elementary schools. I had my teacher group in there the other night, and they, those two elementary teachers did express some concern about kids being in that full week, full five days, and how that's a little bit more difficult for that age group. So let's, we can kind of continue to have that part of our conversation. And then I think we as board recognized through our conversations last time that you know, that planning that's going to go into two years out is going to be extensive. And so if there's some opportunities to bring that kind of a status report to the board and kind of let us know how it's going and how things are being adjusted, that would be helpful. So we, over the next couple of 18 months or so, we have some, have some comfort that, that the high schools are able to work through that with those unbalanced. Uh, classes. Okay, um, now I need a uh, motion and a second to approve the 2019-2020 and the 2020-21 school calendar as presented. So, so moved. I'll second that. All right, moved by Mrs. Crabtree, seconded by Mr. Gandy and Mrs. Hutch. Mrs. Hutchins, would you please call for a vote? Mrs. Crabtree? Yes. Mr. Gandy? Yes. 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 Mr. Uh, yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Yes. Thank you again for all your work on that and the team. It's exciting. Um, next is uh, next is oral reports. We have three oral reports tonight. The two first two really focus on students. We started this at the last meeting, so just as a quick refresher for the board, we. Um, we thought it would be nice to have a short, um, five-minute-ish kind of feature on social and emotional learning as well as student learning features and with the idea that we don't want to ask a lot of additional prep time and research of our um, assistant superintendents are going to be leading this effort, but just kind of a quick update on some of the great things that are going on in our district for kids. Yeah, uh, first of all, thank you for the opportunity. As I said last time, the opportunity to talk about social and emotional learning at each of our board meeting time is a privilege and it brings to light the great work that's happening in our schools. Um, just a little context, uh, at our last board meeting, I reported on some of the work that was happening at our elementary school, specifically at Madison, how they were recognizing behaviors through a positive behavior and intervention support approach. Um, I'm gonna kind of turn the tide a little bit on this one and move to the high school level. And um, I'm gonna talk about drug prevention a little bit. And the reason I do that is I want to draw kind of the understanding that social emotional learning is a broad and large topic that ranges from how we teach behaviors, to how we build relationships, to how we build mindset, to how we have preventative practices as well. Um, so uh, in, in that mindset, I, um, on November 15th, I had an opportunity to attend the Morgan South. And uh, as part of their drug prevention programming that's uh, required within the health classes, they, uh, they actually bring in a guest speaker or presenter from Robert Brown, who's really an expert in this area. And, and I have to tell you, uh, one, her presentation, she spoke to all of the health classes that come through. So all the juniors receive this, either here in the fall or in the spring, um, was engaging and focused really on the social and physiological risks. But it was also brought to our students in a decision-making, a self-awareness sense as well. Um, so our students were really, really engaged. 
Um, we North does much of the same work in their drug prevention pieces. They partner with Robert Brown. And both of our schools partner with Serenity House as well. So I bring this to light as well. Serenity House um, is a counseling service really for, for addiction. And they actually bring speakers to our high schools to speak to our kids, former addicts that are of teenage or early 20s age, to really resonate with our kids. Um, so why is this important to social emotional learning? This really falls in that emotional wellness strand that we're building within our social emotional learning framework. Um, and it's that preventative education piece as well. And then lastly, again, it brings to light how we are partnering with our communities when you look to our outside resources when you think about Robert Crown coming in and working with our kids and you think about our counseling services. So I um, wanted to highlight the, the work that's happening at our high schools and also draw your attention to the broad framework, the broad work that is social emotional. So um, we'll take any questions now. Hi everyone. I, I, I'm, uh, I'm a little concerned about the, you know the, the direction the state's going a little bit with marijuana, and you know it sounds like you know the new governor or governor elect is, is uh, thinking that as a good revenue source for the state of Illinois. And I'm curious of whether any of the programming you you just did. I, I, I'm sure the age will be above 18 and so on, but I think it sends a different kind of message if it's now a, a social use drug. I guess. Uh, I, I'm, I'm curious, and I, I'm sure you're not going to answer this right now, but how we're going to deal with that if this comes to play. And then I'm curious of whether there was any addressing it in this current. So there wasn't, question, answer your last question, there wasn't any addressing of the kind of current political state or that. Well, uh, I don't think it would completely change the um, composition of the presentation or, or the learning opportunities provided because the real focus is on. How does this affect your body? How does this affect your future, your decision-making skills? Um, and one of the things that the presenter is very cognizant of is, I'm not gonna be able to follow you around your home. I want to educate you, right? Uh, I want you to kind of know the path. What happens to your body when you do this? What happens to your to all of your abilities? How are you seeing it? And so I think that that has to continue to be our focus because we know kind of two things in this area. Preventative education, is a preventative factor. And then really the expectations that our schools and our parents and families have for our kids around the drug piece you know, are the preventative factors. So no it was not addressed there, um, but two, I think the focus has to continue to be on the physiological and social basis. Any other questions or comments? All right, thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, oral report number two is our student learning feature. talk to you about the reading frameworks uh, District 200 are twofold. One is the very backbone of our reading instruction for K-8, and having a reading and framework is really unique. Uh, many other districts don't have a reading framework that they've developed and talked about the different types of instruction. They instead buy a curriculum or pieces and go through that, and we made some decisions early on not to do that, and it kind of is all summed up in this quote about what instruction needs to be. It's my belief, and kind of it's why I'm in education, is to find this balance for all of us, to have a system that keeps us together, but also have individual autonomy, both for staff and for students, because there have to be common experiences, common standards, but everybody learns and teaches a little bit differently. So we developed a framework to match those needs and it's not a new framework. We started this right when I uh, came in, and it's been in progress for quite a while, but I hadn't really had an opportunity to talk about it with the board. So I can give presentations on this for days and have, so I'm not gonna give all the different pieces that went into the framework, but I want you to see what keeps us common from kindergarten all the way through eighth grade. At kindergarten through fifth grade, we know each student's reading level, and we have to make sure that we're meeting those needs. So we have, whether it's in kindergarten or all in middle school, there is a time that you're doing whole group instruction where you have that text and the teacher is modeling those pieces. And then there are small group times where we've looked at what the reading levels look like, and we're matching what text 
those students need or the different pieces and skills those students need, and then everyone has a time for independent practice as well. And what that allows us to do is to meet the student needs where they're at, also match some of the teacher creativity on how they do that, but keep some commonalities between English learners, special education, PACE, general ed, so that we have a common way to talk about reading instruction. So what does this impact? When we do classroom walkthroughs, the things that I look for are the things that are listed on the reading framework. And we talk about how do you push students through the different levels. When I meet with the reading coaches, we're spending tons of time on the reading framework. Coming up on January 18th, there'll be more pieces about guided reading and what that looks like. Now that special education has merged into my department, I'm spending quite a bit of time with special education staff. Got to do that last week with all of our case managers at elementary and middle school and make sure that they are also feeding into the reading framework. Our English learners, our PACE. When I talked before about MTSS and Tier 1, what does that instruction look like? Every single one of our students needs to have all components of that reading framework. And that's what I'm talking about when I talk about Tier 1. It's also a time for intervention, where our interventionists pull out during guided reading time in the classroom to meet those needs. And then with the new state law, some people are asking me about acceleration and what that looks like. Acceleration happens during that middle column in those reading frameworks where you're picking text and moving students. So you might have in a second grade classroom students that are at kindergarten level, fifth grade level, sixth grade level, and it's at that time that the text are appropriate and match the ability of the students. So that helps with our acceleration piece. And currently, the whole reading framework drives much of the elementary scheduling of the day, as all those pieces need to fit together so our specialists can go into the classrooms and so that grade levels can work with the students and the PLC process that was just talked about. That has to be the fastest I've ever done the reading framework. All right, any questions? Okay, thank you. One quick question. So uh, I've gotten a couple of questions occasionally, and actually one person that's kind of regularly asked questions relative to dyslexia, and I think what's kind of at the core of the questions around that is, how are we explicitly teaching phonics, especially at the primary grade levels? So if you go back to any of the frameworks, the top pieces are all the different types of skills that are pushed through all the different types of instruction. So concepts of print, phonemic awareness, phonics skills. That's expected to whole group instruction where you've got that explicit piece, then it's practiced in the guided reading piece with the text at their level, and then when students independently read, that skill or the phonics skills are reinforced during independent reading time. So, I mean, some people use that version of guided reading that it's just everybody reading, but it's a very specific way of teaching and reinforcing the skills that have already been dealt with whole class. Do, do they have a specific resource that they're able to use to? Yes, uh, I uh, worked with a group of people that we created a phonics sequence uh, for our kindergarten, first grade, and second grade, and they work through those different skills to teach the phonics piece. The end, the end product of this is on these test scores. I, uh, what, what do we see? That if, how do we evaluate the result of this? And, and can you give me a little history of how those evaluations are run? Sure. Um, well, we do have our district locals. Uh, we also have the state test, but they don't start until third grade. And a lot of the magic of reading has happened well before that. Uh, we also use a Fonis of Canal reading level system where each student reads with an adult and you find their just right reading level and then that's what pushes through guided reading and we keep track of that um, as well. Um, there's also informal feedback that comes back from students and from staff of narratively how they are doing because there's some writing that happens with reading and things that don't show up on a standardized test. Uh, our reading scores and the state tests have changed you know quite a bit and we've matched that but what our scores have stayed pretty level while our demographics have changed quite a bit. Um, so really, we are achieving very, very well. And if you look at how our English learner students are doing or how districts are doing that have the same percentage of English learners that we do, we are outperforming them. 
I have a quick question. As I'm looking at the three through five reading framework and I'm looking at the suggested times, those times exceed what our students are in pace. So how are we managing that? So, um, here I can put that up for everybody else so you can see what she's talking about. So the flexible grouping or that differentiated time is when pace occurs. So pace isn't supposed to be the uh, replacement of all reading instruction. It's that time that's that just right instruction for the students that are above. And our pace students get a differentiation or acceleration time every day, as well as our, our lower students get one or more times of that flexible grouping or just right instruction every day. So then the independent time that's, that's allowed in class is for everybody? Correct. Okay, any other questions or comments? All right, thank you. And uh, the third oral report has to do with one of our favorite topics. Um, financial and facilities management goal update, Dr. Schumer. Yeah, Mr. Farley's going to uh, handle this one. You're going to see we've made a, a, a perfect line right down the senior leadership team. We went from Dr. Kyle to Dr. Salagi, Mr. Dahlquist to uh, Mr. Farley. Everybody's um, uh, getting in on this. I do want to just say really quickly in the foundation to this that, uh, um, one, well, I know we've spent a lot of time around facilities. Uh, make no mistake, providing, I think, the appropriate learning environment for our students, and that includes the facility in which they learn is a goal that's essential to them. So I don't want to understate this goal as as not being central to, I think, our, our mission it very much is. Uh, Mr. Farley is going to take the board through for us what I think is now the, the, the next step. So we celebrated tonight through the, the groundbreaking invitation, kind of the second of the third priorities that I think the board um, has accomplished around the facility plan. And we turn our attention now to the capital needs that we very much uh, uh, talked about. And so um, we're not, obviously, it's an oral report tonight, so no decisions are being made tonight, but we want to introduce the concept to the board tonight, begin to get some of your feedback around this because kind of your feedback on this concept that we're going to introduce today is going to be essential then as we move forward with some other key processes that are in front of us, such as the development of our five-year financial projections, obviously the development of our budget, decision around facility work that's going to take place in summer of 19, as well as, I think, some key messaging and communication to the community around how I think we're building a very thoughtful plan to, uh, to address this. So, turn it over to Mr. Farley. Thank you, Dr. Schuller. Uh, tonight we're bringing forward uh, just an update on our board financial facility goals, as uh, Dr. Schuller mentioned. I think it's important uh, to remind as you look at the, the school work plan, and uh, this has been uh, discussions that have been going on back in the summer uh, relative to the work we're doing. I uh, appreciation to the both the uh, board finance and facilities committee who have uh, helped in, as we go through this process and we've discussed uh, how both of these intertwine. Really, I think as we've talked about, uh, as we go into these meetings, three, three key factors come into play uh, that we remind ourselves all the time as we have a discussion relative to our finances. First is uh, the board that will pass a balanced budget, and that's through board policy. Uh, that's noted up here. So we know as we go into this process, we are a balanced budget is the, the one of the primary goals that we have to look at as we start having these discussions. Second, we have a board fund balance policy, which we put in place uh, seven, eight years ago now, that uh, gives us a range uh, between 25 and 40 percent above where we want to be as far as the district with our overall fund balance. We also, through that fund balance policy, say that we are uh, within that targeted range and we have uh, uh, funds available that we put that towards capital work. And then finally, the Sherman Durgis uh, formula, which we instituted two or three years ago as well, gives us a target as far as what we should be allocating, uh, setting aside, to really set aside, but what we're allocating for capital needs of our school district. To, uh, that's a formula that we worked uh, through uh, the facilities committee and JRO's uh, work as far as keeping that, uh, that model updated as we do work and as we look forward to our overall uh, capital spend and where we're going to go. 
Uh, the other piece that tied into this as well is our debt, uh, future debt this chart. If you've already seen this before, again, just a quick reminder that the gray area in the background is what uh, the debt was set to look like. Uh, we would obviously a uh, uh, spike uh, in 2022 uh, um, through a four phase process, which three of these phases have been completed. You can see we've leveled that off actually next year uh, for the uh, FY. 2019 levy, we'll actually see about a million dollar drop and then our overall debt, and then that levels off uh, across through 2022, and then 2023, there's a four million dollar drop, and then it, it goes down a little bit more towards this debt that is not uh, uh, intended. So, uh, again, as we look at our debt and the availability of uh, all revenues, this is the our debt insurance moving forward, something again the board should be familiar with the same debt. Uh, so targeted work, most of 2017 referendum after uh, it was unsuccessful, uh, the board identified three key areas of work that we needed to address. First was secure entries. There were eight buildings that had been identified through the project uh, that were uh, in need of having secure entry work done. Uh, again, we had secure doors. We, we did have visitor guidance to get them into our office areas. Uh, so, uh, that was a, obviously a key project that we wanted to get done, and that was completed obviously uh, this past summer. All eight schools, so now we have uh, all of our schools have that same entry process uh, in, uh, for our buildings, and so that, that work is completed. The second thing was the Jefferson Early Childhood Center, which uh, we were a of that was successful uh, uh, in the fall. Uh, that that uh, work is now in progress. We talked about our groundbreaking. Our schedule, working on schedule uh, for the process of uh, getting that building built, so it's open in 2020. Thank you very much. And then finally, we have the projects identified in our capital plan, which are in progress. And just for the purpose of review, uh, over the past two summers since the referendum uh, was unsuccessful, uh, we've done uh, a number of major projects throughout the district that have uh, kept JR and uh, his staff very busy. Be a roofing, uh, we can do four mentioned secure entry work, flooring and masonry work, paving and concrete work, HVAC mechanical work uh, for about $7.3 million over the last two years. So, looking forward, we asked JR and the, and the facilities committee has reviewed potential projects for the summer of 2019. Again, along the same lines and the same type of work that I've outlined here. Uh, the different projects and where the work would be done. So it's obviously uh, a significant amount of work at uh, multiple facilities throughout the district at the same time that we're uh, building the Early Childhood Center. But you can see that there's uh, about eight million dollars of identified work that, come, that is identified off our capital projects plan that JR has indicated work that we could try and get done this summer. Uh, obviously, this would all be done through a, a, a public bidding process. And Hope the good numbers. These are the eight million is the number we're carrying in our overall capital plan. But you can see we have uh, a number of identified work, and we, some of this that includes some alternate works uh, for roofing and other projects that we may choose to do if we're going to do a whole roof. Uh, uh, there may be other sections we want to get done at that time. So uh, this is something that uh, and JR reminds me constantly that we want to, we don't want to start bidding this too late. So obviously, as we talk about decision making. Uh, we want to start getting work uh, identified and get bids out on the street so we can uh, uh, get it done. Some of the doors and some of the other things have a long lead time, so we want to make sure that we uh, uh, get those bids out of as soon as possible. Uh, to achieve this, the, the Finance Committee has looked at a, a four-year funding plan. Again, since we don't have the final audit to the board yet, and we're still in the process of uh, uh, working with the Board Finance Committee on assumptions for our financial uh, five-year plan. Uh, we uh, obviously will look at some type of plan to pay for these projects and incorporate that into that funding model. But as Dr. Schuler previously mentioned, we did have a good uh, year, fiscal year last year. We did improve on our fund balances when the audit is accepted. We'll see our fund balance actually went uh, overall percentage went up, even with uh, some transfers that were made. Uh, for the uh, early learning center and early childhood center and uh, for uh, some other work we did in the district. But uh, one of the things we talked about in the last finance committee was looking at a four-year funding plan to try and 
get up to that $7 million figure, you know, which ties back to the Sherman Dirges formula. And uh, by doing so, we looked at a commitment of uh, an increase in budget line item for capital spend of a million a year over the next four years. And at the same time, to meet the, the difference, we would the fund balance, again, wanting to stay within our fund balance policy, but uh, increase our uh, dedication of some fund balance of three million made in one million to, to a point where our overall budget is at a point where we're spending uh, around the Sherman Dirges figure each year built into our overall uh, operating budget for, the, uh, for each fiscal year. I believe you have a, uh, a spreadsheet also that uh, Dr. Jewler included in the, uh, your green tank as well. That just all that thing as well. Okay, so uh, just just to do the crosswalk for you, so uh, you have in your green folder as well um, a spreadsheet that walks from fiscal year 19 all the way out to fiscal year 27. Um, I saw a couple of people looking at this, so let me just kind of help you with the crosswalk. If you are putting the, the debt service payment number that's on the spreadsheet, up next to the, the debt service payment that's in the presentation. Um, they actually do match, but the, that chart is built on levy year. Levy year does not match to fiscal year. So levy year 2017 aligns to fiscal year 19. So remember as we, we pass the levy, by the time that levy funds a budget, the budget number is always the second of the calendar years that that budget covers. So there's there's a two year gap between the, the numbering of levy year and, and fiscal year. So levy year 2017, that, uh, that, that debt service number, again, was just a hair over $20 million. That's how it aligns in the, in the chart. So if you put them up that way, those numbers do align as you, uh, um, as you, you move across. Um, and, and again, so uh, this is a concept, right? It's a concept that we introduced to the finance committee to start to, to lay out. I want to just a couple of things that I want to highlight right uh, in here. So um, uh, under Sherman Dirges, Sir Sherman Dirges forecasts the amount of money that should be spent on capital improvements. Does not say that that money can only come out of the current year budget. That budget that can come from current year budget allocation or the use of fund balance, if appropriate, to, uh, to, to draw it down. Obviously, in fiscal 20, that's our upcoming year, if we immediately jump from a $4 million budget allocation to a $7 million budget allocation, you're going to have two potential concern points there. Either A, you're going to have a very difficult time balancing the budget, or B, you're going to make some incredibly painful decisions that are going to impact the student experience in order to be able to immediately jump that three million dollar divide and so i do want to remind you just historically if we brought some history um, to this chart it was really only two years ago where your capital spend number was a little over a million dollars. This is the capital spend number, not including the million dollar commitment that you're making out of the budget on an annual basis to that lease service payment, so what you're doing in, uh, in there. And so what we've, we've done is tried to map out kind of a four year ramp where we're slowly drawing from fund balance, bringing up that annual budget allocation uh, each year to the point where within four years, we get the board through your budget to that that Sherman Dirges target, right? That's a, a part of your, your move, right? So the assumption in this chart uh, is that obviously you would be able to balance your budget every year. That's something that we'll have to uh, obviously continue to work on. That's difficult to, to model in this chart, but you are still consistent with your fund balance policy. At no point, even as you draw down, do you drop below 25%? So what you'll see as you move out, that at the low point, we don't have the percentage model, but in actual dollars, you are always $5 million above what would be that 25% floor within your, your fund balance. So rather than modeling it in a percentage, we modeled it in dollars uh, for you so um, that, uh, that you can see it meeting your 
your Sherman Dirges allocation. So you're, you're monitor, or you're, you're adhering to those three key policies, but I think most important, I shouldn't say most important, from, from my perspective, advantage to this, we're not modeling or suggesting to the board that you do anything that adds to the debt service over the next uh, four to five years. And so that type of, of discipline in terms of how you manage your long-term debt would also get not only this board, but future boards to a place where they have a, a lot more flexibility in terms of future decisions on how work gets funded, but for the community realistically get you to a point where you are looking at debt service completely falling off, right? From the, the district or significantly reducing, right? For the, uh, the, the district. And so uh, I think that that's a positive thing, both in terms of, uh, of, of obviously honoring commitments that you've made uh, to the community over the last 12 months, but also setting people up with much greater flexibility moving forward in terms of how the, the capital work uh, get, gets managed. And again, you know what you can see over a, a four-year period of time is you are taking a meaningful chunk out of your capital improvement work, right? We, monod we modeled in the 2017 referendum an $84 million capital improvement need, but we projected that as an eight to 10-year solution. Uh, for the, the board and so that's one of the reasons we also went out as far as we did on this because if you if you stayed consistent with that trend in addition to what's already taken place over the last couple of years um, you are knocking almost 70 million dollars off of that capital plan so you are you are doing a meaningful chunk of work at the 7.2 million dollar uh, clip every year which uh, again uh, obviously can can be adjusted. So, no final decisions. What we really just wanted to get your thoughts are, and kind of get your feedback on is this concept. Because it's of, if it's of interest, it will drive obviously our planning for summer 19, which we've got to get started on very soon as we start to uh, plan out that work, but also as we model projections, uh, this would be an important concept to have some feedback from the board as to what you think of it so that we can start to model projections. Dr. Chu, do we anticipate addressing the fourth phase of the debt refinancing uh, this spring? It, that, that is when we're scheduled to do it, and of course this chart is built on the assumption that you will complete that last phase of the restructure. If you don't do that, you will not take, you will not knock that ski slope off that's in the background. What is the date of that? We need to finish the soon. Dan, we will do it. Yeah, what's the early state? Uh, probably May. We probably, I think we still were planning closing it in July. May or July? May to July of 2019, correct. Okay. Um, so what we're saying is, is in the next four years, we're going to be able to tackle all of this without going out to the community and asking. Correct. This this plan does not include any ask for uh, additional referendum or non-referendum authority. I think what I, I kind of disagree with that statement. I, I think that what we're challenged with as we will now move into the second phase of this, this is the building side, is the financing side. And, and we have to get the projections of the use, you know, again, the ability to spend the roughly $8 million a year, you know, without the consumption of fund balance. You know, like, you look at that one last page, there's about $3 million of fund balance out of the eight. So that means we've got to find in the budget $5 million, okay? And we've spent, you know, on the last couple years, $3 million. I mean, I, I, I guess we budgeted $3 million, I guess is a better way to say it. Yeah, yeah, we spent $7.3 million in the last few summers. We spent, but we budgeted how much out of operations? Uh, it was uh, 3-2 last year, and a million was out of capital projects a year before that, and it was uh, through the name, which is not Okay, so, we're, so what we're saying is if we just conceivably we've had a balanced budget the last few years, and 
you know, we're, we, we've been better than that, but we're, we've got three million set aside. In the first year of this, we're, we're looking at four million. Okay, so we have to find a million next year. And the second year, we have to find another million after that. So, I mean, there's still challenges on the financial side that we have to move forward with. And, you know, I, I guess the other, you know, the other comment I have on this is that, um, you know, we, you know, this, I like calling this the Gambiani formula versus the Sherman Durgis. Seriously, because Sherman Durgis, technically, you're setting up reserves for the next time the roof has to be repaired. And this is paying for the deferred things that we had done in the past. So, technically, Sherman Durgis is a future funding, you know, putting aside a dollar today so when the roof is going to be needed in 20 years, we'll have accumulated those dollars. We're, we're, on, we're on a current spending approach for the Gambiani effort. So, yeah. mind if I do. <laughs> so, you know, I think there's still, you know, we've got, I think what we've said here uh, is that this, you know, we're working toward finding those dollars. And I think that's the next challenge that we're going to be approaching, you know, finance committee meeting this week coming up. And then as we look at the assumptions we gather, going to that next step and say, will this all fit in? Now that we have, I'll call it the, uh, the uh, facilities committee saying that they're going to spend eight million dollars a year. So, so, and again, you know, I just, and then who knows if there's a roof or something that, you know, another million that pops up or something. So, you know, we have to kind of worry about that all the time too. But, so again, I just want to go back. We said that back in the referendum in 17, we had 80 some thousand, give or take. Of that 84, okay, we spent, uh, what, 15 million over these last two years? Is that a, sorry, there will be by the time 19 is next is the fiscal year we're in. Okay, uh, so this is the summer of 19. So that would be actually fiscal year 20. Okay, so we'll have spent some of that, and then this program goes out one, two, three, four years. So that accounts for roughly 28. So we we have to then continue with that, and that also assumes there's no inflation and things like that that pop up. Yeah, but, uh, I, uh, recall that in the in your capital improvement plan, there are inflationary uh, elements built into that, right? So it, it assumes based on years going out that they're not all present dollars; they're they are going out. Okay, so the eighty-four million takes that into account. Okay, so we'll need to continue this program beyond the four-year program, obviously, to get that eight to ten-year cycle completed. So you know, I think again we're absolutely giving the right attention to this project and this program and catching up with the past and uh, you know it's just a matter of how we can get this into the numbers without affecting other aspects you know i, I think i would think it was hinsdale today i just heard about you know they're they had a referendum fail they're now starting to cut programs so they can do exactly what we're trying to do here so you know you know we're not home free yet until we get the second phase of this which is the financing or the you know the budgetary Changes, I'll call it, to allow us to spend those eight million dollars eventually out of operations. So. Yeah, Bill, I, I agree with uh, Mr. Matheson. The this is a great uh, placeholder, no question. But clearly, the the truth is in all the line items on the budget. I want to see the revenue streams. You know, there's going to be in a few years there'll be another uh, teacher contract negotiation. There's a lot of moving parts which we just have to account for. And so when I look at these numbers, these are just a few of the expense items, and we haven't even seen the revenue line items. So at some point in time, that's gonna bring more value to me and better clarity relative to, is this real or Memorax? But it's a good placeholder and a good starting point, as Mr. Matheson says. But for me to start giving really good credence to this as a finance committee member, I'm gonna need to see the whole, all the elements, if you will, because there will be some significant moving parts some of which we can control, some of which we cannot. So we'll move on at that point. Yeah, and, and again, though, all those pieces will be a part of that five-year projection piece, right? But, but if that concept, obviously, if this concept makes no sense to anybody to even think through, then we, we wouldn't necessarily build these elements, at least on the expenditure side, into um, that, that set of projections. And, I, and at last kind of just because I think both of you made it, make, make no mistake, I'm not trying to paint a picture that increasing that budget allocation by a million dollars every year is an easy lift, right? If, if it were, we should have been doing it long ago. So th this is still going to require 
some lifting, right? It's it's not you know a jump of a four million dollar shift in, in that that you know it, it, it you know creates a, a wholesale need to make major cuts to programs, but um, that this is going to be a lift as we move forward. Certainly, it's going to impact the ability to consider like major programmatic additions, right? As we continue to explore, get asked questions about, you know, things like, you know, later high school start times that might carry multi-million dollar costs associated with it, that would be extremely difficult, right? To, uh, to consider some major uh, programmatic elements. But what I will say is that in large part, this phased in approach probably gets us to a reset point that we probably should have been at. Right, candidly. So this is a reset process, which is going to be difficult to make a few decisions that are still going to be difficult as we kind of get ourselves back over a period of time to kind of this reset where we probably should have been in at collectively. One, uh, one item you mentioned there was uh, you made reference to the teacher salaries and so on in the future. I want to thank again our uh, administration, uh, Dr. Raymer as well. Um, for their successes in uh, settling a contract for four years just recently for, for this district without a strike with a you know with a fair and equitable settlement of numbers and so on and, and things that i read about in the uh, uh was it Tavia or geneva you know and things that you know we were concerned with uh, the step and uh, ladder approach i call it but the, you know it, it's just that we we planned that ahead we got it done and it, you know, I'm so happy that we did not have the strife that, that went on in that district. That's so damaging, and, and you know, that was really a great achievement, so thank you all. Just, just to that point, you know, thank you also the teachers who worked with us, right? It was collaborative, it was a partnership, it was a long-term view. Uh, that goes such a long way. You know, you watch the news, and I am thankful <laughs> every time I turn that news on for our teachers, for our administration what goes on in this district, it's amazing. So that collaboration and partnership is awesome. So thank you to the teachers as well for helping us get it. All right, any other comments? So I'll just kind of wrap this up, my understanding. So this is a roadmap, so to speak. It doesn't have all the answers yet, but it's a roadmap that would enable us to make significant investment in our buildings to kind of get into that capital facility plan. It would enable us to comply with our three policies and do it in a manner, at least for the next roughly four years, to do it without having to add new debt into, into our charts that are still on page. Those are the three parameters that we would be able to accomplish if we were able to execute this really every year. Every year, this is a decision making process that has to happen. And, and there's, there's factors that come into play that we might not know about that are outside of our district that influences the state of Illinois, the economy, et cetera. Okay, any other questions on that? All right, I guess we have uh, where is my discussion items. We have another one of our favorite discussion items, the student fee discussion. Dr. Schuler? Mr. Farber, yeah, he doesn't get to go anywhere. Uh, so this uh, this is a follow up um, uh, last year as uh, we reviewed fees uh, with uh, the board. Um, uh, there was uh, there was a request as we get ready to review fees this year for some additional information relative to uh, our fees specifically for um, activity athletic uh, uh, programs. So. Um, you're not at the point yet as a board where you have to make a decision around fees, so uh, you have this information early so that you have some time to digest it. No decision being made again around this uh, um, tonight, but I'm going to let Mr. Farley walk you through the, the chart that you have in front of you, and, and, um, and then uh, again, you can have a little bit of conversation around it, but the goal tonight was just to kind of get this in front of you so you can start to digest it, and then we'll uh, forecast for you some decision points coming up. Thank you, Dr. Schuler. Uh, the package you have in front of you is, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the Finance Committee and for uh, review the fees uh, a month ago. I believe we were two months ago, two 
months ago now, early October, uh, did review and uh, talk a little bit about the fees and what uh, the Board of Education was looking for as relative to fees and uh, athletics and activities. Uh, what you have before you is uh, an updated document that thanks to the uh, high school athletic directors and activities directors because there's uh, information on activities as well. Where we try to put together some uh, information that the chart you have shows you the uh, illustrates the fall sports. We have that information uh, now paid for this uh, for this uh, school year. Uh, so the athletic directors were able to finalize and put together information relative to the fall sports and the board is okay with the format, uh, which is somewhat similar to what we've seen in the past. We'll continue it on and uh, update with better information once those uh, sports are completed as uh, Dr. Schuler mentioned the few approval process happens uh, later in the spring. Uh, but just uh, again, the, uh, the information is relatively the same. We did add some additional information relative to uh, fee collection, but it's outstanding as well as uh, uh, free and reduce uh, students who don't pay uh, the fees and, and what's uh, anticipated to be owed. Uh, so that's under the revenues. Um, we also uh, illustrated what percent of the expenses are paid for by the school district. Uh, one off to the right then is you'll see that is what's uh, in the impact is of fundraising and current contributions. I think that was a predominant question of both the board and finance committee as to uh, what are these programs generating as far as um, uh, fundraising or requesting currents to write a check for the program uh, to cover uh, certain aspects. And what we did uh, on this as well is we give you the percentage of Funding, assuming those expenditures, uh, all of those expenditures for that fundraising or for the OIN program, you can see that drops obviously uh, the overall contribution for the district. But we also listed below the uses of, and tried to summarize for you the uses of the additional revenues um, uh, overall. And uh, just want to pay attention to the pool on the back and where I was going through budget reductions and talk about the swimming program, uh, the cost of the rental of College pool uh, was uh, born by the parents. Uh, it's a fun, fundraising effort. Uh, the parents or uh, or direct parent contributions in order to maintain that program. So the parents, uh, since that time, have obtained the pool rental. So you, you see that indicated on this form as well. And as you go down the list of the, the sources of additional revenue, you see a lot of the cloth, as we mentioned in the past, and the forms of peril rank here, travel here. Also for transportation costs associated to go to uh, off state or other different types of uh, university trips. Uh, you also see competition fees and then you get into some of the uh, activities that we've listed. Uh, uh, on the pages you see there's also for uh, projects, and uh, some other competition related to music that the music programs also provide um, as part of their program. So, uh, you can see the overall, uh, or athletics, the overall, first page expenses came by the district is about 24%, uh, which means the rest of the revenues are, are the difference between the overall cost of the program. Uh, that percentage drops to about 60% when we start factoring in uh, the assumed expense of the expenditures that are generated by fundraising and uh, the revenue and contributions. Again, this chart is most of it's uh, similar, but we did add some different aspects. I didn't give uh, questions regarding the format or any information provided on the table now. Yeah, is that, was there, uh, what, what's the motivation for leaving the activities separate from the uh, sports in the layout? I'd like, I'd like to see the activities laid out the same way as we can compare activities and sports together, if possible, because I think the participation in some of the activities is quite high, and I'd like to see that balance if that's possible. I do think that a lot of the activity, activities, uh, when you look at those charts. Hey, no, pull that mic up right there. Sorry. When you look at the charts for uh, the activities, the direct expenses, most of those are related to salaries and to transportation. Uh, that's the majority of uh, the overall costs. Uh, you can see the um, how the uh, use of funds uh, are outlined as well as the program funds. We can try to work with the activities director to put it do a similar format as that one is if that uh, was helpful. We, there's different nuances to the activities uh, that uh, we wanted to try and capture in the spreadsheet uh, that uh, illustrates it a little bit uh, different, but uh, we can uh, try to uh, follow that and look close to that one. Yeah, the motivation for me, just one, one program, 
programs I happen to know are these band programs, right? And if you look at the funding for South versus North, it's very different than what the district is paying. But also if you look at the participants, there's a, there's a big swing in difference in participants. So it would be interesting to see how that plays out. I'd like to see how it compares also to the sports programs. Um, Phil, I appreciate you, you laid this out. I know I was one of the people in the last year that, that really wanted to know especially about, about fundraising. I guess my question that I still have is, what are we, what are the expectations for fundraising? Because I think sometimes what the district feels we're saying in terms of fundraising is this is your maybe your goal but i think the message that's being heard from my parents and students is this is required so i guess what i want to know is are there any required fundraisers and if so what are we asking because there are some sports where or activities where i'm hearing from you know from parents that oh we need to we need to sell Three hundred dollars worth of these cards, and we need to sell five hundred dollars worth of this, and and that that's the expectation. And the parents are writing the check for the difference because they can't find anyone to do it. Is there is that an expectation, or is that a suggestion? And how is that message being conveyed? And Chris, I, I'm going to be very honest with you. I don't think you're ever going to get a complete answer to that. I mean, that's a fair question. I get it. I don't think you're going to get a, a fair answer to it. I think um, the in the big picture, right, the, the reality is when you look at uh, revenue and expenditure, that if we are uncomfortable with the fact that exactly what you're just talking about is a part of the fundraising process, right, you can't effectively raise funds if you don't challenge people that are raising funds with targets, right, you've got to give them goals and you've got to you got to push to that. I've, I see it as a parent this year of a high school student where I know the message that they're being given to try to meet a fundraising goal, right, is, uh, is aggressive. So I think that is going to be a part of the fundraising process. Also, I think tied into if you're doing significant fundraising is the fact that parents are going to approach that different. Some parents are going to say to their kids, I don't want you going out and selling to friends, neighbors, whatever, so I'm going to write the check, and others are going to be more comfortable with, you know, students going out and, and soliciting those those sales. So I think if ultimately we're not comfortable with that process, then in the big picture, a decision we have to make is that the $155,000 that was raised that went to these expenditures, either we have to say to the programs, you can't spend any of this money, you can't do the stuff that it's being used for or we have to look at a different model for fee that somehow is going to take fundraising out of the picture by probably equally distributing that across athletes that are participating aka a much different fee structure so one of the questions i know i had i had last time when we were doing fees is what is that money being spent for? And, and, it, and how are we monitoring that? Because in some cases, and, and from what I'm hearing, you know, if, if people are fundraising for things that are basics, that are required and needed to be able to, to use that sport, I question why are we fundraising for that and why aren't we paying for that? If it's for tournaments and things like that, when does it become excessive? Like who is, who is monitoring that? And do we have it equitable between both of our schools? Yeah, so uh, what I will tell you is we have a process. It is monitored by the athletic director in every one of those circumstances. So the athletic directors for their own internal workflow have a much more detailed uh, uh, kind of flow of information that, that knows sport by sport. What are we fundraising for? How much are we gathering and what's that money being used for? So, and they have an approval process for those fundraising activities, meaning that um, uh, clearly, like, like the you know, message is if you're going to raise funds, there need, there has to be a targeted need that that's being raised for. We're not just going out to raise thirty thousand dollars just so we have it to spend, right? There's a targeted need, and so there is a process in place that's through the athletic directors that's 
uh, that's ultimately overseeing that. And then where is the oversight at the district level to make sure that it's equitable to the most schools? That's my thing. Do we have that process in place? And should we have that process in place so that one school isn't doing something that's significantly different than another school in terms of expectation? Um, if, you're, if you're going to continue to allow fundraising to happen, you are going to have inequities. You're going to have inequities, right? There isn't, I, I'm just going to tell you in that model, um, uh, I, I, you're, you're going to have a difficult time getting to complete equity. If you really want equity in terms of spend and opportunity, then you centralize that as much as possible. You raise all the revenue, you distribute all the expenditure through only through budget distribution. Um, this model that we have does allow for a degree of local control and decision making around individual programs that have a target, something they want to do. There is an approval process that they go through. But, but I guess to your question, I don't know that there is a deep equity lens across, no, you can't do this in the basketball program itself because we're not doing it in the basketball program at North. Those are programs that have some autonomy in terms of you know, what, they're, what they're raising for. If, if the kind of the equity in terms of opportunity for kids is the kind of the, the prevalent concept you want to get to, then I think it's got, we, we are going to have to take kind of this right part of the spreadsheet and really rethink that, right? In terms of either just saying none of those opportunities are available anywhere, or we got to increase the revenue through fees and completely control it then through budget allocation. Which, you know, if, if you move across again outside of a couple of anomalies, certainly when you look at all of the other expenditure piece, there's some, fl some slight fluctuations that change each year based on number of contests that somebody's hosting, home versus away football games and all of that, that impact it. But, but there's pretty equitable distribution in the other piece, save the fact that even your structure for paying coaches has something to do with experience and elements in the contract that it may not be exactly the same from one school to the other, but it's much more equitable than uh, the piece on the right. Um, in my first year on the board, I think Jim will recall this, um, there was an effort by a group of parents and supporters of one of our high schools to um, kick off a major fundraising campaign to, um, to, to construct, that would finance the construction of some major facility um, improvements, enhancements at one of the schools, and they sought, um, I'm not sure if they sought formal approval from the board, but encouragement and endorsement of that approach. <coughs> and the board at that time decided not to endorse that approach. And I can tell you that generated some hard feelings on um, a um, major portion of the, of the population of the parents and supporters of that one school. So <clears throat> if there is some thought that somehow we want to adopt the policy of equity and, and central control, um, I would encourage that we go through a very extensive community engagement process. Beforehand, so we hear what, what our residents feel about that as well, because um, that experience <coughs> generates some different perspective. Okay, uh, can you help me think through the either the unintended consequences of this and take some my personal point of view? So, my personal point of view is I don't like when students are asked to sell. And whether it's door to door or family members or whatever it might be, it's just a personal point. Of view. But I am very much in favor of students participating in a fundraising event organized by a coach or, or some type of some type of district oversight. Um, does, it, does changing the guideline like that have unintended consequences, or just something I haven't thought about? Um, yeah. 
Yeah, that's something I'd want to I'd want to think about. I mean, I think you know to to some degree, um, uh, one of the things that uh, I do know that the the two schools are cognizant of as well is um, not having like like fundraisers that simply trip over each other and are doing exactly the same thing. So there's probably to some degree a limited amount of opportunity for you know if this group's selling cards, we don't want. 10 teams selling the same cards, right, into the same uh, activity. So I, I, I don't know, I'd have to think through what would be the, the consequence of it. I, I would guess that um, if you limit fundraisers by saying you can't do anything that involves any kind of direct sale, even to family and friends, you probably put a pretty tight parameter around what those opportunities are that they exist to do some fundraising if there isn't some potential sale element in it. I'd like to, uh, you know, I've seen these numbers. Uh, I think the finance committee one time was put in charge or had the charge of trying to figure this out and so on. I just, you know, I just keep coming back to the same place. I, I don't, you know, I don't, uh, philosophically, I, on one hand, what's the cost per student or what are all these charge tones? You know, I think, again, we're providing an education. And if we buy into the thought that the uh, extracurricular activities, the band, the sports teams are part of that process, it is what it is, and it costs us a number of dollars. I, I guess, you know, I don't know that uh, the board members are capable of, of making a decision on this without basically a recommendation, you know, from administration based on whatever happens in the rest of the world. You know, because I, I keep cycling around. I mean, what is, what, what is an effective way? I mean, one of the cuts that uh, Insdale was talking about was sports program. Well, now we have a number that, you know, maybe it's a half million dollars a year. You know, I mean, not that I want to cut sports, but I mean, that's a number, so what? You know, that's a different type of decision that we're looking at, and whether we raise money or don't, you know, we have another sport that's coming on here, you know, potentially. Uh, so I, I guess, I, I, I think that we need to set up some general guidelines of, you know, whether it's fundraising programs or whatever, because if we keep talking about specific line-by-line items, -line, specific programs and so on, you know, I think we keep just circling around the same drain, and I, I just, I, I don't know if we'll get anywhere eventually. So I think we need, you know, the gathered facts now here, and you know, let's say that, uh, you know, maybe on a club, if we uh, if we don't have more than ten members, it shouldn't exist. Maybe those kind of things, uh, and maybe that's not true either. I I just think that I don't feel I'm in a position to make these kind of decisions for you know these specific programs, you know, or you know, maybe we should say that every program should has to be funded sixty percent. I mean, you know, I I don't know. I I don't have enough serious feel for what that is and because uh, it kind of works now we pay what we pay and i don't know that we can tweak it or try to balance it everywhere i i just you know i think uh you know when we go and visit the schools we hear about the kids how much they enjoy that aspect of going to the clubs and so on you know so i think we have to make sure we're incorporating all the kids in the programs and they, and uh, you know, there's a lot of sport opportunities that you know allow kids to go to college that might not have otherwise go to college. You know, so that's part of the funding that you have uh, the sporting programs. So you know, and there's some imbalance. I would bet you know, and you know, I look here that you know uh, somebody's gaining admission is better this year than last year just because the team did better a lot. You know, so I, I think I, I just need to have what I would call some good general guidelines of philosophically how we want to approach this. You know, versus trying to come up with line by lines. You know, or say, you know, is fundraising okay or not, or you know, or you know, or who's in charge at the high schools? Maybe you know, this is we we give the mission to the, the principal and say, okay, you can raise, you know, like we do with their kind of discretionary budgets at the high schools. You know, this is the kind of thing that you have to collectively say that you guys are on the front line, and here's, you know, we can raise or have X number of programs, and let's, you know, if, if the football team wants to do this and the uh, you know, the band wants to do this, you know, those are all part of that program, but if, you know, you can't overdo it or you can't be competitive, but some way it's controlled other than at this level. I, I just, I, I can't, uh, I can't get a handle on this at this level, so that's my feeling on it. I get back, I wrote the word down, I get back to intent. What's the, what's the intent? What are we trying to achieve by the, by the work? Which I think is what you're getting at a little bit. Um, and for me, I think I, I, I'll just go back to what we heard a lot from the lacrosse team, from the parents, the kids, and it was inspiring. 
it was awesome to hear those kids talking about the opportunities, what they've been able to achieve, what they've done after sports. We heard, we heard from some graduates, right? I thought that was fantastic. And so, as I've been thinking about this, you know, the intent for me is to make sure every dollar we're spending engages the most kids possible, whether it's sports or other activities. I mean, you go down, go down turn, the, turn the list over of all the stuff that's going on, right? I mean, yearbooks, student council, class sponsors, all of that is engaging students in something outside of the classroom, and I think that's awesome. I just want to make sure every dollar we're spending is, is getting the most kids engaged in all those things. How do we pull kids in that are at risk? How do we give kids opportunities? How do we expand with our understanding? So that, to me, is the intent. How we get to it, I think we have to try to figure out a little bit. I think this, my second point is, going back to listening, we've heard, it's like I've heard from our community, you know, the fundraising aspect of it. There's a, there's a frustration with it. I can't put my finger on it. I don't even have a good idea how to fix it. I can share you with, share with everybody my point of view, which I did. But other than that, I'm not sure how to address it. So the intent is to engage the most kids possible. And the second point is listening to the community and hearing that there are people who are frustrated. I think those are the two things I would like to focus on. I have a couple of quick questions. One, um, it's helpful on the sports to have the column that shows us the number of participants per sport. Um, is it possible to see that on the activities too? So that we know, you know what we're spending money on and like Rob said how many kids that applies to? Yeah, we'll try and pull that information together. I think uh, yeah, part of it is some of the clubs it's just who shows up certain days, so okay. club participation is free, there's no registration. We do have a number of required participation levels. I think we run clubs and we have this uh, as well. So, but yes, we can work go back to the student activities directors and see if we can yeah, some of them will be a lot easier to get than others, but we can definitely try to pull that information together. Um, my other question relates to fundraising, and it makes me wonder if there's some way for all the sports teams at a particular school to collaborate in some way, and the fundraising effort that goes into the athletic program as opposed to the piecemeal of the soccer team does this and the swimming team does that and, and whatnot. Um, here in the area, one model that comes to mind, there's a a 5G race that goes off every spring called the Human Race, and it's a collaboration among a lot of um, social service organizations in the area who, on their own, would be too small to be able to pull off some sort of fundraising athletic event. But they come in, and I don't know what the formula is, but depending on how many people come and participate and you know check off that they want to be. Um, supporting your organization, you get some amount of the fees that come back out of it and whatnot. So it just makes me wonder if there's some way to be a little bit more streamlined. I, I kind of like that what you just said about maybe having a, a consolidated pot that's directed by somebody, and I'm not sure I want a principal doing that, but or whatever. But you know that then is allocated amongst the sports. And in that way, you kind of control the activities potentially as well. I, I think that's an interesting item. And, and, and getting back to Chris's point, if we need to raise money for football helmets, we should have football helmets. You know, that, that really isn't, I'm not quite clear what all the fundraising supports. So I, I think that maybe that consolidated pool at each school or whatever might be a, an effective way to kind of achieve that. And again, if, it, if it's something specific or a necessary safety item or a this or that, you know, that, that, uh, that would be, you know, that would be a way that we need to look at that a little differently than whether it's not. And maybe we take away some of the costs, uh, you know, these, uh, you know, approaches. I, I like those two thoughts. But yeah, just in closing, I think we're going to have to solve this problem. This has been before the Finance Committee for probably five, six years. And I guess I've always asked the same question. What is the end game? A little bit to Rob's point. We're losing a half a million dollars a year. Are we okay with losing half a million dollars or aren't we? And if we are, we move on and, and dismiss this topic. If we're not, and we have to have people who are smarter than I am anyway at the, at, the, at the senior leadership team, and people have to bring some ideas on how we shrink that. You know, and, and I'm, I'd say this every time we have this topic. You know, the $660,000 of expenses, 68%, our coach salaries. Don't have an answer for that. That's just an observation. That's a big number. Almost 70% of total expenditures are coaches' fees. 
We need coaches, I get it, but I'm just saying, what is the end game? Or we're trying to shrink the half a million dollar loss per year, and someone brings something forward to us, and we'll, we'll try to support it. If we're not, we just have to accept the fact that it's a, it's a lost leader, but it's good for the kids, it's good for the, the school, and we move on. So that I think that's where we've got to get some guidance from you guys. I mean, if it's a really, get this as a neutral, uh, you know, a situation, then we have to make some tough decisions. No, I think that's a good challenge us that, that that's probably a conversation we need to have together because I, I, I didn't, I'm not initiating this conversation. I, I'm not suggesting we have this conversation because you try to get to a complete cost neutral point on all activities. I think the part of this conversation started um, because we had a, we, we did even going back a couple of years as we look at the percentage of the cost that the district was underwriting, we accept the fact that there are some costs that increase incrementally over time, whether they be the salaries associated with those that are running the programs, the cost for officials, other purchase services that go up. And so there has to be a point where perhaps what we charge to kids has some reset points as well. So I think we started this conversation around saying we ought to know what percentage the district is covering, track that over time, and when we start to see that, that percent shift a bit where we're underwriting you know, 74% currently, when that starts to creep up closer to 76, 77, 80%, then maybe that's time for a bit of a reset in the fee to say it's a fair time to consider going from 150 to 100. 60 or 170 dollars that was the concept that started this but then like i said we what, what kind of came into this is kind of where does a whole fundraising element fit into this and i don't have an easy solution for that other than to you know i yeah, i don't have an easy solution for it so that was my end game i guess when we had the conversation is every year we're charged with bringing fees to the board uh and the easy solution to that fee discussion is just to never change them because then we don't have to have the discussion about why, but there are points where we have to, to reset that and that's then where we have to look at, it's helpful to look at a guiding philosophy so that we're establishing some groundwork for when do we come back and revisit it in the future. And when an opportunity like lacrosse comes up, that may also be an opportunity to say, you know, we phased it in under one model to see that it was sustainable, to see that students would participate, but, but then at some point, we're either gonna leave that out forever on its own model or incorporate it underneath the funding model we have, but then bringing that in and maintaining the 74% piece may also mean we have to reset fees a bit to, bring a little bit of revenue in to kind of keep us at the same element. That was the concept that, I, or the lens, I guess I'd say, I brought to the, the conversation. But if that didn't match the, kind of the, the interest of the board, or you have a different problem you'd like for us to attack or try to solve, we're happy to do it. My, my, my intention when I brought this up last year was I just want to know a true cost to a parent. I mean, that was what I was trying to get at. And, and we can say the fee is $150, but if the expectation is another $1,000 out of the parent's pocket, to me then it's $1,150 to do that activity or sport. And that's just, that's where I was trying to get at was what is the true cost to the families to participate in these activities? That, that was my intention. So let me try to wrap this up because I wrote down the word end game too. So I think it's, you know, we've had this conversation, I would say, in earnest since last summer after the rough run. And I think there was a lot of uh, interest of the board to look at all these different buckets on how we could increase our revenue. And this was one of the ones that got us into the, into the conversation. And this, this research we've been doing and the way this is presented is great. Um, I like to, you know, at the end of the summer, maybe at the, the spring sport set of this, so we have a full year look to see if there's a, a number. But, you know, I think one end game is the board deciding um, or getting a recommendation from the administration. Here's, here's where we want to be, either increase or decrease the fees for whatever parameters we establish. That seems like one one kind of core recommendation. But the other one that's kind of involved is, is the fundraising. And 
you know, that we need to do something different on fundraising. You know, uh, Rob doesn't like it. I think sales are important. Maybe maybe it's too young to uh, put that on our students to, to do that door to door. But I think those are the two kind of buckets that where we need to, as a board and a district, kind of zero in on those two things that we can not just go through and update this over and over again. I think with this kind of data for the, for the current school year completing next spring, I think we'll have great data. But in my opinion, what I'm, what I'm hearing is those are the, those are the two components that, that we're kind of looking for. Is that a fair summary? I think it is, but I don't know where the solve comes in that conversation. You know, I keep, you know, we've got data and we've got, we could have gone back and worked on more data. I, I just, you know, I feel like we have to have a, Maybe with the athletic directors or some conversation to see if there's better input that we can get. I, I don't know. I just I don't know that we'll reach a conclusion based on anything that we're talk, you know, talking about. There. And, and I guess the last thing that I've been to know to bring it to a close, right? So uh, when we're trying to solve a problem, that problem can come from one of two places. Obviously, it comes from from my staff bringing to you as a board. We see a need to revamp a model that's not working for us, and here's our recommendation, or obviously you as a board, through your community lens, what you're hearing from the constituents you represent, you bring a problem to say the way you're approaching something's not working based on feedback that we're hearing from the, the community. So I, I do wanna say just from, from the inside perspective, well, it's not perfect. We're not bringing to you, I guess, a suggestion that the way that this is being handled isn't working from our perspective. So, it, so I, I guess what I would say is, if you look to say, you know, Jeff, bring us a recommendation. What I would likely bring to you is going to be some tweak of this current current system, not an overhaul, because I don't I don't believe I'm not hearing at least internally, that it's a complete mess we can't control, we don't like, you know, it, it's not working. That I would need input from you if you really are saying, based on what you're hearing collectively representing the community, this is not working, we can bring you that options to, to, to fix it. But but just know, I guess, if you leave it to, to me or say, what would you bring? I would likely bring you some tweaking of this current model that, that largely is in place. And I agree with that, Jeff. I, I think if, if there is a problem with fundraising, you have anecdotal information, and that's all it is, anecdotal. Uh, I would suggest we consider at least, I'm not saying we certainly won't even consider tonight, but maybe we want a, a, a student survey for parents to see their reaction to what their feelings are about fundraising particularly at the high school, that's where the primary takes place, then <clears throat> see how those results come back to see if we really have a problem with the fundraising. You know, uh, I appreciate how uh, valuable all of our community contacts are, but I'm not sure they're comprehensive on the course to make a, a decision about whether we really have a problem with the or not. You, you have an advisory committee as well, and so uh, maybe this is a topic that you want to give to an advisory committee to spend some time with, wrestle with, determine the, the best way to solicit that input. Okay. Um, we have a few written reports on the agenda which are provided for information. We have the much monthly financial reports and the FOIA report. There was one FOIA. Got my hair, shortest lawyer report ever. Uh, any questions on those reports? Okay, and then uh, in terms of reports from board members, so we have one board committee report um, attached to the teaching and learning committee event back in November, and I believe the HR policy committee met yesterday. No, no meeting notes out yet. Uh, any other reports from board members? Yeah, okay. If I may just briefly, I <coughs> Representing our district at the delegate assembly at the IASB conference, and I reported in my report about the report that took place on resolution number two, which was a resolution to arm uh, teachers and staff, um, particularly the downstate districts that uh, don't have the luxury of having um, officers, police officers in the building nearby, and how that was defeated. 
Um, and it's the second time in the delegate. The first time I was a delegate, the, the controversial resolution was to uh, whether um, our lobbyists, the lobbyists of the IES should lobby the General Assembly to modify the curriculum standard for science to allow local control curriculum for science, in essence, to allow <clears throat> districts to decide whether they want creations part of the science curriculum. And that was a very controversial resolution. I approached our delegate representative yesterday that was uh, on our um, board governance session yesterday. <clears throat> I would like to pursue, uh, unless there's some you know, objection, a uh, board member uh, uh, approaching the IASP uh, leadership and suggesting that they adopt a, a, a protocol and unless the resolution to direct our lobbyists to do something, that my ESP lobbyists to do something, doesn't pass by two thirds of the board, that uh, it, it doesn't pass. Um, it dawned on me that if that resolution number two passed by a slim majority, which it did, but it passed, the lobbyists in Springfield for the ISP would be approaching uh, representatives from the 70s and saying, the school districts in the state want to have our teachers and staff on. And it would be far from the truth because there was such opposition. Um, so unless somebody has some objection, I'm going to try to um, approach um, the leadership of the ISB on my own to see if I can at least get them thinking about changing the protocol for the documents and issues for the So would that go directly to ISB or would that go through the DuPage Division resolutions? Right now, this will be a campaign, a singular campaign on the right part. Um, but uh, I don't know if you're in contact with board members from other districts, I want to mention that uh, idea to them and see if there's some feeling in them about supporting that approach. Um, I give them a look at the basis of what's the United States. I mean, I've been, I've gone, I think it was last summer. I participated in a focus group, and when we have a one district, one vote policy in our state, and so our district with 20 schools, and a neighboring district with one or two schools has the exact same vote. I think your idea of what you're saying would help create more of an equity with that as well. So, all for it. Okay, any other board reports? All right, uh, our topic for future discussion includes five-year financial projections, uh, two future meeting announcements on January 26th. Next year, we have a chat with the board at 9 o'clock at the SSC, and then on January 30th, a few days later, we have the Committee of the Whole meeting at 7 p.m. also at the SSC, and at that meeting is when we'll be doing the five-year financial projections, which we refer to tonight. Um, are there any public comments or not agenda? Nope. Okay, so now, uh, so we do have one? Sorry. See, Harold, now I have to read that comment here at the end. Am I going to read it? Am I required to read it? Yeah, I'll just go ahead, Harold. So we have one public comment on Harold, on, by Harold Longs on non agenda items. Good evening, uh, my name is Harold Lawrence, I'm a district resident. I just want to talk about the sports and sports fees. Um, it's very interesting discuss discussion. Uh, I do believe sports and these other programs and clubs do provide a very good service to students. I personally have two kids in, in high school. I know Rob has students, I know Chris and Jim had students in high school, and Jenna too. I mean, you see how many kids participate and it does provide a avenue for the kids to be active and participate and you know and, and be good people in society. Now when it comes to uh, these fees and stuff and cost, uh, I know in the past I know Bill pulled together some information from uh, other districts and I noticed some uh, districts have higher student fees which cover all sports but they're very expensive. I think they're up to like four or five hundred dollars per student. I just thought about this while you guys were discussing it. How about just charging all the high school kids like $25, like a 
student, another student fee to offset some of these, like say, fundraising portion of uh, the cost of the 25,000 times about 2,000 students would be about $100,000 of uh, money that could offset some of the fundraising costs. And this way, it won't be burdening you know, these other athletes or club people for going out and trying to fundraise like $300, $500 worth of, uh, of, of funds. So that's my thought. And also, uh, having uh, kids in, in sports, I also noticed that sometimes they're some some sports spend you know very uh, very frugal with their expenses, and other ones seem to spend a little more than they need. So that's my my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Daryl. Um, so closed session items are listed for possible action: the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees of the public body or legal counsel for the public body including hearing testimony on a complaint lodged against an employee of the public body or against legal counsel for the public body to determine its validity. 5 ILCS, and I don't know how to read this, Jim. 120 slash two, subparagraph C, subparagraph one. Is that close enough? Do I have a motion and a second? So moved. Second. Second. I second the motion to adjourn the closed session. Okay, um, so this this is Erickson moved. Mr. Roman seconded. Roll call. Erickson. Yes. 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 Yes.